Thank you all. I haven't really done anything yet, but I appreciate the applause. <laughs> Great conference so far. My God. I'm going to try and bring that down a little bit. Um, <laughs> see if I can put you all to sleep with the, the post-lunch. Um, I thought what I'd do is uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what I write and why and how I came to write it, and then throw it open to questions. It's just it's a little more entertaining for, well, me that way. Um, <laughs> And hopefully for you guys, too. So start thinking of your questions now. Uh, because also there are prizes for people who ask questions that really surprise or entertain. Um, and they'll be thrown at your head, but with love. So that's, you know. Um, the title of this year's conference is, uh, I'm told, is Magic and Mayhem. Uh, I'll be representing the mayhem side of the equation. Uh, very little magic, but plenty of killing. Um, my, uh, my background, I, I fell in love with the written word when I was a little kid. I, I actually remember the moment when I learned to read, when the symbols clicked and I could suddenly break the code. And I've been desperately in love with it ever since. Uh, and I knew that I wanted to be an author from the time I was about five. Um, so blessed with that knowledge, I promptly went into another field. Um, <laughs> and I uh, went to college for political science and then... Um, went into advertising, marketing and advertising, for about 10 years, uh, which I like to joke gave me the perfect experience to write about criminals and thieves. <laughs> which really, it did. <laughs> um, but uh, after a number of years in it, I was, I was getting a little tired of it. And I, uh, I was working in a very small agency, which sometimes that can be wonderful. Sometimes it can be a hitherto unnamed circle of hell. And I was in the latter. Um, <laughs> And I, uh, I would just come home every night very frustrated and finally just hit my boiling point and said to my wife, it's like, I'm done. I'm done. I either quit or I set the building on fire and I probably should quit. It just seems like the simpler route. Uh, so we sat and talked about it and uh, the next morning I went in, went to talk to my boss's assistant and uh, was promptly laid off. The uh, five minutes before I gave my resignation, they gave me the boot, which I took as a, as a good, uh, an excellent reason to go ahead and write the novel that I'd always wanted to write anyway. <laughs> sort of a kick from the universe. Um, so I, I worked freelance for a little while and would write the advertising copy for a week or two, and then I'd go home and work on the novel for a week or two. Uh, and again, it was, it was fun because I was dealing with criminals on both sides of the equations. Um, and then I, uh, when I finished it, which is the best part of the whole process, selling it is amazing, getting an agent, all that stuff, but finishing the book is just the best part. So after hooting and yelling and screaming for about two weeks, um, I sent it out, and I was lucky enough to get an agent and, uh, and sell the book. And since then, my life has stopped making any sense to me whatsoever. Um, but in a really good way, uh, I enjoy it. I've had tremendous luck. Um, the, uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a film agent. And I, I love this story because I'm really not an L.A. type of guy at all. And uh, she called me and she said, uh, great news. Ben has the book. I said, great. Who's Ben? <laughs> she said, you know, Ben. I said, uh, ben, of course, turns out to be Ben Affleck, which apparently I'm just supposed to know by the name Ben. Um, but I was, I was very lucky in that they actually, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon's production company, recently optioned the, uh, the book to make a movie. <laughs> Thank you. Fingers crossed. Fingers really crossed. Um, so we'll see. Now that the writer's strike is over, hopefully something will happen. That'd be really exciting. But, um, I, you know, I can read to you if you guys would like, but I figured after lunch that really would lead to everyone snoozing. So I'd, I'd rather just throw it open and chat if that's good. Uh, so, shoot, give me a question. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry? What did... I think the blackmail photos that I sent uh, had an important thing to do with it. Um, well, you know, it's funny with the whole... <laughs> it's funny with the whole L.A. thing. I don't even know if Ben or Matt have even read the thing, you know? Um, their company bought it. I've never met them. Uh, I just like to say Ben and Matt as much as possible. Uh, but uh, their, their production company did um, Gone Baby Gone, a recent film this summer, which I thought was amazing. Uh, it's a, an adaptation of a Dennis Lehane novel. I'm a big Lehane fan. And it's a labyrinthine novel. I mean, it's five, six hundred pages, plots interweaving with plots. I thought there was no way they could pull it off. Not to mention Casey Affleck's a little Weasley-looking dude. There's no way he can be the character, except 
he owned the screen and the, the script was fantastic. So I'm very hopeful that they'll make my book better too. <laughs> yes, sir. Sure, sure. The question is, what is my writing process? Um, well, it starts with about four hours of wandering around, banging holes in the wall with my head, and realizing that I have no talent. Um, and then I sit down and write. It just seems to be how I warm up. Um, in general, I write five days a week. Uh, I uh, don't let my butt out of the chair without a thousand words a day. That's sort of the minimum. If I'm going, I keep going, because you never know when it's going to hit that way. So you you love it when you have it. Um, but a thousand is sort of my, my baseline. Sometimes they come really easily, you know? Sometimes they just tear right out. Most days I'm pulling every last one. Um, and it has to be a thousand words I intend to keep. That's the other thing. It can't be just a whole bunch of crap that I acknowledge is crap. Uh, so. Do you have a question? No, you were just, yes ma'am. Um, not very much, personally. Uh, writing's kind of a weird thing. There's a, a book by Norman Mailer on writing um, that I haven't read. <laughs> but it's, I love the title. It's called The Spooky Art. And I, I just I dig on that because there's really something to that. I, I don't know where it comes from. It's a, it's a whole brain activity, right? There's, there's the rational, conscious part of your brain that's chopping and folding and collating and using the stuff that comes up. But the best stuff just kind of bubbles up and all you can do is show up and hope that it shows up. Um, some people get that by doing some free writing and stuff in the morning. Honestly, I do it by pacing around and thinking I have no talent. Um, it's, uh, my, my brain seems to need to kind of process it, figure it out, and then I sit down and do it. Um, but then the best moments are the ones where you're surprised, too. Uh, there's the, uh, the metaphor I use for writing a novel is that it's like taking a road trip. You know, I need to know where I'm starting. I need to know where I'm going, and I want to know the highways to get there. But I can't know where I'm going to stop for gas. Um, and I'm incapable of knowing the little side excursion that's going to end up being my favorite part of the whole trip. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you have read uh, The Blade itself. Um, there's a scene in it, which I won't give away for those of you who haven't, but there's a scene in it uh, that is the main character reminiscing about a game that he played when he was younger. And it's in a very tense scene. And the game is basically a really amped up version of Dare. Um, and that turned out to be my favorite part of the book. And it was one of those days where nothing was coming. I mean, nothing. You know, I'd done my four hours of pacing, and then I did four more hours of pacing. Uh, and finally, I said, just sit down and write something. And uh, what came out was this, this game that they played that, for me, became the heart of the whole thing. You know, that's, that's my favorite part of it. So if you read the book when you get there, you'll know that's my favorite part. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely none. Absolutely none. They could cast the Golden Girls, uh, <laughs> which actually might be kind of funny. Um, I have no control whatsoever. Uh, they've been very generous about letting me pretend I'm part of the process. Uh, and brainstorm and such with them, but uh, once you sell it, you just hope. So you want to pick people that, if, if you have the choice, you want to pick people that are going to do, you think are going to do good work with it. Uh, I got lucky because I just sold it to whoever was buying. Uh, I worked in advertising, so I'm, I'm a prostitute. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> what actors do? Uh, when I was writing it, I kind of had three actors in mind, and I don't know what direction they're going to take this, so, you know. Um, but uh, for the two principal characters, who are old, old friends, and very similar guys, started as very similar guys who went in very different directions, I had in mind um, Ed Norton, Mark Wahlberg, and oddly enough, Matt Damon. Um, and I figured that any of those three could actually play either of the two characters and bring the, the energy I wanted to it. I don't know who's going to be in it. It may be B. Arthur, so we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll see. I'm sorry, ma'am, did you have? Uh, do I get the voices that tell me things when I'm writing? Um, when, you're, when you're writing, a lot of times characters, you want them to 
go in a certain direction. It fits with your story and your plot. And for me, what will happen is some part of my brain won't believe that that's where they should go. Um, and so those are the days that I pace a lot and, and get very little done. Usually I've come to learn that that means I'm, I'm trying to force something that won't work, that I don't believe in. I don't actually hear their voices. Um, I think that's probably a key to adjust the dosage of your medication if you're, if you're hearing. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Forgive me. Um, I'm sorry. You get a book just for me making fun of you. That's, sorry. What else? Way in the back there. <laughs> uh, the question is who taught me how to pick a lock, which is uh, something that I did learn for the book, uh, the first book, because my character was a thief, and he's, uh, he's not really a muscle type of thief. He was brains and plans and lock picking and that sort of thing. He was stealth. Um, who taught me how to pick a lock? Uh, Google taught me how to pick a lock. <laughs> I went online and typed lock picking. And I, I kid you not, and I got 1.2 million pages. Uh, so I, uh, I ordered a set of lock picking tools. Um, <laughs> Because that's the way my brain works. Uh, they're just they're little bent pieces of wire. There's nothing to them. You know, you, you, you could use paper clips if you were, if you were adept at it. Um, and I bought a lock, and I strapped it to my kitchen counter. I took it apart so that I could kind of see what I was doing. And my wife came home, and I'm standing at the counter. I'm like, so what are you doing? Like, Working, baby. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can write this lock off. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's... It, uh, it was startlingly easy. After about two hours of practice, I could do that deadbolt. After about another hour, I could do the deadbolt on my front door. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to tell you not to lock your doors because that could, you know, sue me when it goes badly for you. But um, it, it's, it's completely an illusion of security thing. It, picking a lock is the easiest thing in the world um, once you learn how to do it. I haven't practiced, so I'd just as soon not be, you know, locked in somewhere to prove my skill. But uh, it really is. There's not much to it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> what gave me away? <laughs> uh, it felt wonderful. These guys throw an amazing conference, and they take really good care of the authors. Um, what they don't know is I'm not leaving. Uh, <laughs> this is it. I'm, I'm staying. Uh, it, it's very wonderful. It's, it's incredibly flattering. And I can't believe the lineup of authors that they've had here. Um, I mean, Carl Heisen's kind of a hack, but I think everybody else is. <laughs> her question was, uh, she said that her roommate in, in grad school was a writer and would always be writing down what people said and whether or not you use that as a, as a novelist. And the answer is most definitely. Um, if any of you do anything funny today, I'm stealing it. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, I saw uh, Neil Gaiman, a, a great writer of, of, of sort of urban fantasy stuff. I saw him speak once, and he said that uh, writers are like magpies. You know, we, we grab the, we collect the shiny bits. And that's really, it's very true. Um, my friends, back before I was writing novels, knew that it was my ambition someday, and so they'd always groan when the notebook came out. Um, but now they're actually asking for royalties, so. That's, <laughs> they have to be dead? <laughs> wow. Um, it, to be honest, I, I, I read mostly modern literature, not just in the genre. Uh, I actually probably read more outside of the genre. Um, but almost everything that I read in love has been written in the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly, a, you know, I, people laugh when I say this, but I'm quite serious. Shakespeare is the best genre author out there. Um, there wasn't a play that doesn't end up with the stage littered with corpses. You know, I mean, there's ghosts and daughters putting out father's eyes and poisoning and betrayal. And I love it. You know, I mean, that's how can you lose? I'm sorry? He is, he is thoroughly dead. 
He is thoroughly dead, yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, my process for choosing a title is to choose one, attach it to the novel, and then watch my publisher shoot it down. Um, the first novel, actually, I, I was really lucky. I, I named it The Blade Itself. There's a, uh, a quote that fronts it from Homer that says, the, the blade itself incites to violence, which just kind of fit what I was trying to do with the novel thematically. And I attached it, and they went back and forth on it a little bit, but they went with it. And I thought, sweet. You know, I got the title, Gene. I'm never going to need to worry about this. Never say something like that, you know. <laughs> uh, this, my second book, At the City's Edge, was originally uh, entitled Accelerant which um, they, some people liked, some people didn't, some people thought no one would know what it meant. I don't know, if you buy books, I think you probably know what can riddle out the word accelerant. <laughs> but uh, whatever. <laughs> um, so they killed it and said, what else you got? And I came up with 10 or 15 and sent it on and said, what else you got? Yeah. Came up with 10 or 15. This went on until I'd submitted something like 150 titles. Uh, by the end, I was just like, I don't call it the tea party. I don't care. Let's call it untitled number two. Um, but uh, then, thankfully, this came together at the city's edge. Uh, and uh, I shouldn't admit that I did this, but then I took that and wrote it back into the book so that it looks like it was intentional all along. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Secret tricks. Yes, sir. I wanted to write something, uh, first of all, where I could make a living at it, um, not to be too crass, but I, I wanted to be able to make a living, but also ha have a lot of readers. And um, crime fiction is, is pretty much the top-selling genre in the world. But once I really started reading it, it it's not been my history. I, I mostly read lit fic, and you know, when I was younger, I read science fiction and so forth. Um, once I really started reading it, I discovered that I think some of the best American writing uh, going on today is in this genre. I, I think when people look back 20 years from now, they're going to see that this was the freshest, uh, edgiest, most interesting f genre. I really, I love what's going on in it. And it's a perfect place to, uh, to explore a lot of thematic issues um, without being heavy-handed or polemical. You know, you can explore race and class. You can exp explore this book, my second book. Uh, my goal was to write a novel that was political without being partisan. And so it's the story of a soldier who's returning from Iraq um, to find a similar war raging in his south side neighborhood. And I wanted to explore you know, our soldiers coming home. I wanted to explore the way that we're dealing with them. I wanted to explore gang violence and corruption and inner city politics. And at the same time, I wanted to hopefully keep people up late. Um, and it's, it's beautiful to be able to do both. I don't know if I did, but it's beautiful to shoot for both. The question was whether or not I, I keep everything, even the stuff that I end up not using in a book, and, and the answer is absolutely. Um, you, you, you pull these words out of nowhere, I, you don't want to throw them away. <laughs> they might not come back. Um, what I do is I actually I have a, a document called Murdered Darlings, and I just cut out all the stuff that I cut out and I put it in that. And at the end, it's as long as the novel. I mean, the one for my second book, I think, is 200 plus pages um, of stuff that didn't quite work, or a scene that I reworked, or uh, just a, a line that I particularly liked but didn't seem to fit. And uh, I, I actually don't go back to it very often, um, but I know it's there, and that's a that's a wonderful comfort. <laughs> yeah. How did I pick the voice that I write in? Um, Discovering your style, that sounds so new agey, discovering your style. Uh, but honestly, it's a bit of a process. You know? um, I, I've, I've read all my life, and so there's part of the way that I write that is impacted by the writers that most move me, obviously. Um, but when you're younger and starting out, you try to write like other people. God bless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, now that I know you're going to buy them, you're not getting a free one. <laughs> Might just. Ah, okay. Writing in first person versus third. Uh, both of my novels are in third person. I tend to like third person, what, what's called close third person. So you're. 
as intimately in the character's head as you can be, but you're referring to them in the third person. Gives you a little more flexibility, and I think personally, writing in the first person can become a bit of a crutch. Um, it can be very effective, and I certainly don't denigrate it, but it, it can make it too easy. It's like adverbs. You know, everybody says, watch your adverbs. It's not that they don't work. They do. They're just so easy that your writing gets lazy if you use too many of them. Um, and for me, I've, I've thus far found that for novels, it's better to be in third. But I'm not, like, locking anything down. Actually, my short stories, which I, I find short stories incredibly painful. Um, but uh, the ones that I like best, and actually a good chunk of them, are in first person. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was the resident lock picker. Uh, I was a copywriter. I, uh, prior to that, I lived in Atlanta for about seven years. Uh, so it's actually nice to be back somewhere where I can say y'all without catching shit for it. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, when I was in Atlanta, I ran a graphic design company um, for a number of years and did that. And then it busted as soon as it was humanly possible for it to bust. Uh, I, I know Creative Circus. I didn't work with them personally, but that's funny. You, uh, you're in Atlanta? Atlanta Connections? No? You just collect the names of Atlanta? <laughs> how do you go about finding an agent? Uh, how do you go about finding an agent? Um, I'll give you the very brief process, and then for any of you who are interested, uh, my website, cleverly located at marcusseki.com, um, <laughs> has a number of articles, and one of them goes into real detail about how to write a query letter and land an agent. So if you're, if you're interested, download it. It's free. Uh, but basically what you do is you, uh, you go to uh, the library. You take books that are somewhat similar to yours in a similar genre. You take them off the shelf. You look in the acknowledgments. You see who the agent is. And then you write those guys a letter. It's called a query letter. You keep it as brief as humanly possible. You sum up your story in three sentences if you can. Uh, these people are very busy, and the faster you can let them met move on to the next thing, the likelier they are to be interested in you. Um, you send that off, and then you start collecting rejections. Uh, it's pretty much how the process goes. I got quite a few rejections. Um, it's, a, it's a ridiculously subjective business. Uh, I, I had an agent, a very, very well-known, powerful agent, tell me that uh, my book had no tension and uh, was not commercially viable. <laughs> so screw you. Um, <laughs> You know, you, have, you just have all kinds of things like that. Where it's just truly subjective. There's, you can have an agent who might otherwise like it, but just picked up somebody like that. You can have an agent who's just in a bad mood when the letter goes out. So you just collect your rejections and keep firing out letters. Sure. Uh, the question was, does an editor ever say things like, I liked it until chapter four. Can you dump that? Yes, they do. Um, that's actually, uh, that's when they're at their best. Um, except when it, you really like chapter four. <laughs> then they I don't know what they're talking about. Um, my first novel, I got fairly lucky. I uh, had five or six really salient points from my editor that made the book better, um, but not, nothing too crushing. My second book, he wrote me a, an editorial letter. He said, I love it. It's great, but it could be better. And here's 14 single-spaced pages on how. <laughs> um, but he was right. I mean, he was right. He's a, he's a terrific editor, and he really wanted to make sure that I pushed myself as hard as I could on the second book, uh, which I, I sort of felt like I had. But um, it, uh, it, it definitely made the book better. Sometimes what I do is I send the book out to friends and family first. I send it to about, I don't know, eight or ten people um, to read and get back to me. And I find that if uh, two or three people agree on something, I did it wrong, you know. Um, it, it happens. You know, you're doing this all alone. Um, so if two or three people say that isn't working, it's it's not working, and it needs to fix. House wins ties. So if it's you know if it's just one person, then it's up up to me. Um, so I kind of have done that, vetted it before it goes to an editor, which helps. Uh, I've never had an editor just say, "I hate this particular chapter," but they do say, "You know, this isn't working," or "This is." Uh, you need to turn the tension up. Or in the case of my editor, on both books, uh, more bodies. <laughs> that was his editor. I was like, really? I killed a lot of people already. But <laughs> yes, sir. Would I ever consider asking for a Pulp Fiction type cover? I love those covers. Um, I think they're, they're beautiful. And there's a great line called Hard Case Crime that's a, a, a 
publisher that's bringing that back now. They're doing very pulp type books, noirish, and uh, using that kind of cover. And I, I, I love them. Um, I don't think I would ask for it per se, but then they don't actually give much of a damn what I think about the covers. <laughs> um, I worked in design and advertising, so I, for my first book, I wrote uh, what's basically a creative brief. And I used words like leading and kerning and typography and Swiss grid and. Uh, I showed other covers that I liked, and I tried to describe the mood, and I sent it to them, and they said, thank you very much. Um, but I've, I've also been very lucky. I, I love my covers. I think they've done beautiful work with them. OK. The uh, question was, what other authors I, I really like? Um, I, uh, I love Dennis Lehane's work. I mentioned that. George Pelicanos. Elmore Leonard just blows my hair back. Um, uh, T. Jefferson Parker is fantastic. He's, uh, he's one that I've sort of recently discovered in the last couple of years, and he's a very smart writer. Lee Child, um, Laura Lippman, those people within the genre. But I, I read really heavily outside of the genre, too. And I think that's, for me at least, that's very important is to not get too locked into the one. So I, I love uh, Michael Chabon and Michael Cunningham and um, Thomas Pynchon and David, David Mitchell and David Foster Wallace and a whole bunch of other people. Um, the funny thing is I, I've made the mistake, I guess, of publicly saying I like Dennis Lehane a number of times. Um, and now every reviewer seems to say, well, Seiki isn't Dennis Lehane yet. It's like, <laughs> Sorry. I'll get right on that. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you research, do you go to more of the options? Yeah. Yeah, the question is, do I research this stuff? Researching for thrillers is just the best part of it. Because it's, uh, <laughs> that sounds kind of morbid, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you just get to see a part of life that you, you generally don't, that you go through your whole life sort of knowing is out there but never experiencing. So, yeah, I've ridden with cops. I've ridden with gang intelligence units. I've uh, interviewed soldiers. I've toured the morgue. I learned how to pick a lock. Um, I, uh, for this, this book, I rode with the gang intelligence unit for Chicago PD. Um, it's, uh, they call themselves the CIA of the CPD. They're basically, their job is to know everything they can about the gangs and the way they work and you know their feuds and so forth to try and control it as much as they can. So they lent me a bulletproof vest and let me ride around with them, um, which I love, uh, my wife a little less. But uh, you know, we, you, I just got to see things that you can't imagine. I, I was asking them, this is one of the saddest things that I, I think I've ever learned. Uh, I was asking them how you gauge the power of a gang. And they said, well, you know, these people don't stand up for a census or anything. Um, so you go by secondary, you go by tattoos and known affiliations and that sort of thing. But they said the best way, simply, you count the number of schools on their turf. And it was just something, you know, something went dark inside of me. Was, but that's, that's really it. That's, I mean, that's, uh, that's how gangs recruit in the, inter, in, in the cities is they go to schools. And uh, it, it's brutally simple. They go to schools and start beating kids up. And then they beat them up the next day and they beat them up the next day. And on the fourth they say, hey, if you're with us, nobody touches you. Is he a ten-year-old kid? I mean, are you kidding? It's ten plus ten-year-old kids are stupid. Uh, it sounds like a great idea to be in a gang at ten. That sounds like fun. And I can't tell you how many clubhouses I built and hoped someone would attack it. Um, but these, you know, these kids are in a little different place. One more question. Who's got a really good question for me? Let's see if I can do this without hurting anybody. Um, the question was, uh, when, I, when I write something funny, do I just sit back and laugh? Um, uh, I, <coughs> I should say no. Um, no, it's very serious. Uh, I, I, I love it when I write something that surprises me, because um, there is a part of the process that you're discovering while you're doing. And, and I do map it out more than a lot of authors do. Some just sit down and start typing. And I admire the chutzpah, but my god, that would kill me. Um, but you still you, you leave yourself open to be surprised. And so I, there have been moments where I wrote something, and I was just like, that's great. I love that. Thank you all very much. Thank you.